we know it is uh, approximately one minute past when something's supposed to start in Notre Dame when the room quiets down. <laughs> so uh, I, I really appreciate that, everyone. <laughs> having to, to um, I wanted to go ahead and get us started today. Um, my name is Matthew Sisk. I'm from the Lucy Family Institute for Damian Society, uh, and I'm going to be moderating our discussion today. Um, we are here to listen to uh, a really interesting talk on using statistical methods to um, uh, understand the public and art on how it particularly impacts uh, the individuals of it. Um, this event is co-sponsored by the Lucy Family Institute for Data Society and the Crack Institute, uh, and I think it really encapsulates the collaborations that the different institutions can have uh, around data and the impacts of it on, on humans in the political scale um, and, and how we can use some of these tools to really understand and inform policy moving forward. Um, Structurally, what we're going to do today uh, is I'm going to give a little bit of an overview um, of each one of our presenters and panelists. Um, we're going to talk um, a little bit about the, the legacy. Hosefina is going to walk us a little bit about the legacy project, um, the, the digital archives from the, the increased process that we have here. Um, and then we're going to move over into um, a formal presentation, a couple of responses from, from our scholars here. Um, followed by a Q&A from everyone in the room and on Zoom, um, and then some concluding remarks. So that being said, uh, our main presenter here today um, is Maria Gargiulo, uh, who's here um, for, to talk to us about some of her work with the Human Rights Data Analysis Group. Um, Maria earned her Bachelor's of Science in Statistics, Data Science, and Spanish from Yale, uh, and then a Master's Degree in Demography from, from Oxford, uh, where she was a Clarendon Scholar. Um, she's currently a doctoral student in demography at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And both um, with her doctoral research, doctoral research and with the Human Rights Data Analysis Group, Maria uses statistical methods to bring clarity to human rights violations in situations where the data are messy, incomplete, or missing altogether, which, as we all probably know, is quite a lot of number of these different situations. Um, our two discussants uh, today um, are uh, Josephine Lutartra, who is a Peace Studies and Political Science student, um, a PhD student. She got her BH, BA and MA um, from the Institut uh, de Politique de Paris um, in Paris uh, in 2018. And her research agenda focuses on exploring the legacies of violent conflict on social movement formation. Um, her dissertation investigates indigenous political participation in post conflict Guatemala. Um, and our second discussion is Matthew Hauenstein, um, who is uh, our newest assistant research professor uh, within the Center for Social Science Research at the Lewis Family Institute for Data and Society, um, a title that is uh, quite a mouthful and I'm sure you're getting used to saying. Um, <laughs> Matt's research focuses on interstate and civil conflict with a particular interest in transitions from civil war and the design of post-war political institutions. He received his political sci PhD in political science from Florida State University and was previously a postdoctoral researcher and visiting scholar here in the Crop Institute before moving over um, to uh, the Lucy Family Institute. That being said, uh, we have, as, as, you, as you've just heard, quite, quite a good panel, quite a good um, number of presenters here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Josefina for a moment to just talk through some of the, the legacy project. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Maria, for being here. And thank, uh, thank you all for joining us in this very academic encounter in the midst of the holidays. Um, my name is Josefina Chavarria, and I am the director of the Peace Accords Matrix at the Crop Institute for International Peace Studies. And I am very glad to, uh, as, as Matt was saying, just to have a project where we have so many collaborating institutes and so many sponsors that it becomes a very long uh, list of uh, thanks to everyone involved. Today's presentation uh, is precisely uh, an expression of that collaboration. So we have uh, Maria, who's uh, mainly a statistician, a statistician, but you know that she's done a lot of things, having respondents from various disciplines and all of you um, in, in this in this encounter that I think brings us to the core issue of uh, transitional justice and is the question of truth. And uh, very often we take for granted the idea that truth can be revealed or that it can be unveiled, that it can be explored, that it can be measured, and that ultimately it can be then understood and fully explained in a text or in a theory, or the testimony can capture 
uh, the essence of that truth. And I think that the work on data and statistics is uh, within the context of transitional justice really pivotal because by definition, um, context where there is uh, armed conflict, where there has been a civil war, when the state uh, might have uh, participated in crimes, uh, in war, in human rights violations and war crimes, what we find is not only a great amount of data that has been erased, but the very nature of violence very often prevents even victims from being able to recognize the types of crimes that they have been subjected to. Because of that, the question of how do you measure the truth and how do you bring together testimonies and data and statistics and estimations is incredibly important. Are we only creating truth commissions that rely on testimonies? and therefore on documentation? Or do we assume that because of these conditions in armed, of armed conflict and, and violent context, what we are aiming for is to actually be able to grasp without necessarily testimonies, but through estimations and integration of different data sets, are we able to grasp the real violence that we are facing? So I just wanna show you to a couple of websites. This is part of the transmedia files of the Truth Commission of Colombia. As you know, the University of Notre Dame is uh, hosting a copy of these files uh, accessible to all without any sort of um, challenge or obstacle or bottleneck or requirement or registry or anything of the sort. The idea that we have is not only to preserve these files, but also to invite all of you to engage with them for further research and practice and policy of uh, an education of peace studies. This uh, is the, the tab of the Truth Commission's um, file or tab on uh, human rights and violations of international humanitarian law. The question, it says, this can't be happening. So this is the first thing that we encounter with this data. It can be that all this happened to us and that we were witnesses, that we were victims very often, or very often maybe even part of the offenders or the responsible ones. And I just wanna show you here if this would work. I'm sorry, that was my mistake. These are some of the data that you can see is being now used in the volume of the final report. This is the work uh, of not only a, a great amount of Colombians, but also international experts from which Maria is part of it, that have been able to create this data so that we can speak about the real impact of the war. 40% uh, of the offenders are uh, estimated or integrated in the data sets to be from the FARC and pay around 24% of paramilitary groups, 19% of the other uh, guerrilla groups, other groups, and uh, state agents around 2%. This is about enforced disappearance. So we have several victimizations, right? So who were the responsible ones for um, and forced disappearances around 52% of the paramilitary groups. All this data allows us to shed a little bit of light on that which happens during the armed conflict. But we are faced with very important research questions, and I hope that we have the opportunity to speak about them here in this panel, which is how, how much can a truth commission or any sort of institutional commission of inquiry rely not only on the integration of indicators of violence, but also on the estimations of experts. Why is there such a reluctance to rely on the estimates of violence rather than, than on the documented human rights violations? If we're able to understand that what is true or not is not only a legal definition, but is a socio-political question and there is a philosophical question and a historical question, I think we will be doing ourselves a favor the more we welcome many other sciences, data sciences, and data management to this conversation. 
So I am very happy to um, to open the space with these general questions, and I look very much forward to Maria's presentation and to the discussants' responses. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm losing my voice, so I apologize in advance. Um, I'm going to try and project. Um, I may give up on that and go up to the microphone in a bit, but we'll see. Um, thank you all for inviting me, and thanks for being here today. Uh, well, if you can. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a bit about a joint project. <laughs> Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about um, some joint work that was done with a really large team um, between the Truth Commission, the Jurisdicción Especial para la Paz. So this is the judicial mechanism that was set up to determine responsibility for human rights abuses, as well as people from my organization, the Human Rights Data Analysis Group. Um, we've received uh, generous funding from a group of uh, European governments, um, the British, the Swiss, and the Germans. Um, I'll start by just telling you a bit more about HRDAC, uh, because some of you may not be familiar with our organization. Um, my voice sounds so ridiculous. This is very funny. Um, <laughs> so we are a small nonprofit organization based in California, um, San Francisco, to be specific. Uh, we are nonpartisan, um, but we are always on the side of human rights. Um, so to that end, we are a group of statisticians, data scientists, demographers who use our scientific training to help partners answer key questions of fact with statistical methods. Um, so we've partnered with um, a number of different organizations ranging from small grassroots organizations to larger national organizations, such as the Truth Commission, as well as international organizations like the United Nations in a variety of different contexts and conflicts. The Colombian Truth Commission was the 10th Truth Commission our organization has been working with. Um, our work started in the early 1990s in El Salvador, and we continue uh, working on things today. So I want to kind of start this discussion by talking about the right to truth, which is something that Safina alluded to. Um, so the right to truth has kind of two definitions. So there's an individual dimension and then a collective dimension. Um, so I'm going to draw on uh, two definitions I like from uh, court cases in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. So about the individual dimension of the right to truth, we have every person, including the families of the victims of serious human rights violations, has the right to know the truth, right? They have a, a personal right to know what has happened to their loved ones in a context of conflict, in a context of human rights abuse. The collective dimension, which is I really what I really think truth commissions speak to, is the satisfaction of the collective dimension of the right to truth requires the procedural determination of the most complete historical truth possible, which includes the judicial determination of the patterns of joint action and of all of the persons who in various ways participated in the said violations and their corresponding responsibilities. And what I wanna focus on in this definition is the notion of the most complete historical truth possible. How do we tell the most complete historical truth possible? Um, and the tool we use often to tell these truths are truth commissions. So I wanna tell you very briefly about the Colombian Truth Commission. Um, one could give lecture upon lecture about the commission, but I wanna just summarize some, some key ideas here. So the full name in Spanish is La Comisión para el Esclarecimiento de la Verdad, La Convivencia y la No Repetición. And I will use throughout this presentation the acronym CEV from the Spanish. Um, so this commission was established as part of the 2016 peace accords between the government and uh, the Forces Armadas Revolucionarias de Colombia, Ejército del Pueblo, El farc -EP, which is the largest guerrilla group in Colombia. So what are its goals? Well, it's a temporary institution, right? The Truth Commission is created to do their job and then dissolve. And it has kind of it has many objectives, but I want to highlight four of them today. So their, their objective is to establish the truth. Again, we come back to that, about what happened during the conflict, to clarify violations of international and uh, humanitarian law, to explain what happened during the conflict in all of its complexity to the public, to the Colombian people, and to provide a set of recommendations for how to move forward. And just to kind of pinpoint this in time, uh, the CEV published their final report so all of the volumes, all of the material Josefina was just talking about in June of 2022. 
And I'm hoping to convince you through my presentation, perhaps some of you are already convinced, but I'm hoping to convince you that statistics is a tool we can use to help us understand the truth in situations where we cannot observe everything that happened. And it is a tool. It's not the only tool. And I really want to emphasize that I view, and I think statistics is complementary to other forms of knowing and learning things. It is not and cannot be a replacement for any other methods, including the other methods that, for example, the Truth Commission used to learn about the conflict in Colombia. It really is a collaborative effort, but I think that we can talk about what the comparative advantage of statistics is, especially in the face of not being able to observe everything that has happened. Um, and before I talk about sort of like the statistics and how we actually do this, I wanna talk a little bit about data because without data, we, we can't really do statistics. And I'm going to explain a couple of situations and then uh, ask some questions that hopefully we will answer as we talk about methods. So the first thing I want to acknowledge is that collecting information about human rights violations in conflict, but also out of conflict is difficult and it can be really dangerous for the people doing it. And that is not to be understated. And as a result of the complexity of conflict and the difficulty of doing this, the data that results is seldom ever sort of a complete enumeration, right? It's never all of the uh, all of the victims. It's never all of the instances of violence, but nor is it a statistically representative sample of the entire victim population. We don't evenly represent in our documented data all of the victims that we have. And I just wanna talk about a couple of ways this can manifest itself. These are, this is not an exhaustive list, but just to give you an idea. So I'm gonna talk about three types of statistical biases that are present in the data. And I'm gonna be very particular about using the term statistical bias. This is not to talk about a social prejudice, although many statistical biases do map onto social pre prejudices. When I say statistical bias, what I mean is that what we observe is not an accurate representation of the true unknown universe of, in this case, victims or violations. So I'll start with social visibility bias. So social visibility bias says that not everyone who experiences violence has an equal probability of being documented. And I think in the Colombian case, I really like to use the example of social movement leaders. Social movement leaders are very visible figures in their communities and in Colombia in general. When a social movement leader is killed, we don't necessarily guarantee that the violence they're killing will be documented, say, by the news media. But it's probably more likely that someone in this highly visible position will have violence documented than, say, a peasant living in a rural area if they experience violence. So again, we have this unequal notion of who is uh, documented and whose violence is not. Urban bias operates in a similar way. A lot of institutions, nonprofits, government institutions are located in, in urban areas. They may have a tendency because they can't access rural areas or because they don't uh, have enough resources to go there to overrepresent the proportion of violations in urban areas, again, relative to what would be the, the true unknown number of violence in rural areas, right? So it's not that no violence is documented in rural areas, it's just that a disproportionate amount of violence is maybe documented in urban areas for all of these sort of sociological reasons we've outlined. And then event size bias is one that I think is really interesting. So say we're thinking about news media reporting. So we're thinking about what a, a newspaper is going to report on. We might think that a newspaper is more likely to cover an event that involved a lot of victims rather than an event that involved a single person, right? So if there is a really large massacre, we would think that that's probably more likely to be documented in the news than if a single person was killed. Now, again, this is going to depend on so many things, but in general, we can see how there might be a bias depending on the number of victims involved. So from all of this, what we learn is that some instances of violence are never documented. If we want to tell the whole truth, right, this notion of the entirety of the truth, what, what do we do if, if some of the violence hasn't been observed, right? How, how do we include these instances of violence in our telling of the truth if we have no record of them? So that's my first question. Unfortunately, um, even when we do manage to document an instance of violence, right, we do manage to document a disappearance, a kidnapping, a homicide, we might be missing key information about the victim, the presumed perpetrator, or the context of that violence. Now, again, there, there are so many reasons why this could happen. There could just be a lack of information. So a family member or a loved one of the victim goes to an institution to report the violence. They may, they just may simply not know the the answer. They might not know the exact day it happened. 
They might not know who the specific perpetrator was. So they may not report anything to the institution and the record will be missing that information. There could be human or technical error. The person taking down the data writes something incorrectly, forgets to save something, some information is lost. I think more importantly, because these are very reasonable, there are fears for personal safety of self or loved ones, right? You might not want to say who the perpetrator is because you are afraid of retribution. And there might be shame or social stigma sort of connected with certain instances of violence or in certain communities. So in addition to not observing all of the, the whole universe of human rights abuses, we have all this key information that's missing, right? So the question we ask ourselves is not only how do we take into consideration records that are missing altogether, but how do we work with incomplete records as we're doing this telling of the truth? And third, something that I think is very jarring, uh, especially as a social science researcher, is that different sources frequently disagree about patterns and magnitudes of violence, right? You have source A and source B. They both claim to study, say, homicides in Colombia during a certain time period. You look at the graphs and they're different. What do you do? Now, I want, I want to say that this isn't entirely unexpected, although it may be jarring, right? Different groups have different organizational missions. They have different criteria for including or excluding certain victims. They have differential access to victim populations, and they all have limited resources. When we take these in, things into consideration, it shouldn't be so terribly surprising that different organizations come to different conclusions about what has happened. Each of, and what you learn is that each of these sources tells a true but incomplete story about the violence as it has occurred. And I wanna emphasize that this is not a critique of the data or any of the organizations collecting the data. Again, collecting data is hard, it's dangerous or it can be dangerous. But rather as researchers, especially this is an empirical reality we need to address, right? We can't just ignore the discordance between the different sources. We can't ignore the missing data. We have to address them head on in our work. And the question that, that we come from here is, how do we navigate the, the sort of differences in the different data sources as we're telling the truth? Do we just pick one of the data sources? And, and if not, how do we integrate the different data sources together? And this leads us to our joint project, where we try to address these sort of three questions, right? How do we deal with missing records? How do we deal with missing information in documented records? And how do we include information from a multiplicity of sources that know different things about different victim populations. Um, so as part of the project, we received a really large amount of data. So it's the largest human rights project, quantitative human rights project to date, which I think is on the one hand really cool, but also is a testament to how terrible the conflict was in Colombia. Um, so I want to hold both of those things in our heads at the same time that this was a massive undertaking and we were able to really do a lot, but it really speaks to the horrors of conflict uh, and how it impacted Colombian society. So as part of this project, we received 112 databases from 44 different state civil society and victims organizations. Um, luckily for us, I guess, not really, um, it was really difficult because every data source had a different format. They tracked different information in different ways. Um, and, you know, we so we had 112 different databases, basically all of them in completely different formats. Um, and in total, we received uh, 12,863,977 records of displacement, disappearance, homicide, kidnapping, and uh, illegal recruitment with the minimum uh, information required for our analyses. I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. But basically, we received a massive amount of data from a lot of different sources that covered a lot of different aspects of the conflict. And it was our job to make sense of it. So what are our objectives? Um, we want to design statistical analyses of patterns of violence in the armed conflict in Colombia. Um, I mentioned before five different violations. Our analyses really focused on four particular violations. These are not the only types of violence that happened in Colombia, but they were the ones we could study with the data and methods we had available to us. So those are enforced disappearance, homicide, kidnapping, and the recruitment primarily of child soldiers. Okay, so we wanna design these analyses. We wanna integrate information from various data sources, again, compiled by distinct organizations. And we want to address missing data problems that impact our data sources so we don't reproduce the same biases, right? We know our input data are biased and that's okay, 
But in our analyses, we want to prevent ourselves from reproducing those biases. We want to try to tell a more complete story. Okay, so now I'm going to sort of, this is going to be a bit more technical. It should be approachable to a really broad variety, but I want to talk about our statistical workflow. Like what, what did we do with all of this data? How did we come to results? So four main stages here. First, data pre-processing, so standardizing and filtering the data we receive. Then we're going to do record linkage to deduplicate the data sets. So we don't want to count a single victim multiple times. Then we'll do statistical imputation. And I'm going to keep using the phrase statistical imputation to differentiate it from imputation in the judicial sense, right? We're talking about data and statistics here, not judicial imputation in any way. So this is going to fill in missing data in documented records and fill in in, uh, in quotations. And then finally, we'll end with multiple systems estimation, which is a technique we can use to estimate these undocumented victims. So data pre-processing was really hard work, but is the most straightforward of the four phases. So we defined and selected a set of variables that commonly appeared across multiple files, things like the victim's name, the perpetrator, the location, date of the violence. We standardized the variable names as well as their values. For example, some files had sex sort of defined in different ways in terms of how they denoted that in the variable. So we made it basically everything into a common schema. And then we needed to filter out records that didn't have the minimum information necessary for record linkage. So this is basically the records had to have first and last name. Um, so Colombian names, typically you have two first names and two last names. So they had to have at least one first name and at least one last name. We needed to know the year that the violence happened in and the department, so the state, basically, the violence took place in. And we filtered out any records that uh, were not for forms of violence we could consider in our analyses. So it was after this filtering step that we had those 12 million, um, almost 13 million records. Okay, relatively straightforward. So now we get to a situation where our database kind of looks like this, but like not really because I'm filling in a little bit of information that we don't necessarily know at the time. So you'll see we have things like the victim's name. This is just person one through four here, but you get the idea. The department or state where the violence took place, the year, ethnicity, perpetrator, and I have a bunch of things with question marks in them. And those question marks refer to missing data. So types of missing data we need to deal with. And in particular, there's three different types of missing data here. So the first type is uh, what's in the blue in the sources column. So when we just have this list of, of records from all our different sources, we don't know which sources document each of the records. So that's to say, if we have Jose Manuel, a victim, before we do record linkage, we have no idea which of the organizations documented Jose Manuel's human rights violation. We need to know that so we can avoid double counting this person. Because what we don't want to do is inflate the number of victims we have. We wanna make sure we're only counting a victim one single time. So that's the first type of missing data is knowing what sources um, an individual has appeared from. And of course, these databases don't have keys so you can't just match them on a key um, and have this all sorted out for you. The second is what's in the green in the ethnicity and perpetrator columns. So that would represent missing data in documented records. So we know that person two and person three experienced human rights abuse, but in the case of both of them, we don't know their ethnicity. And in the case of person two, we don't know who the presumed perpetrator is. And finally, what's in the yellow, and we don't know their numbers, for example, so it just says person question mark, those are all the victims we haven't documented. We don't know anything about these victims and we don't know how many of them there are. So our goal with our analyses is to address these three different types of missing data. So first we'll start with record linkage. So as I said, some victims may be documented multiple times, either within a single database or across multiple databases. We need to avoid double counting because we need to be able to identify unique victims. And if we have uh, the same person multiple times, this can impact our analyses. And I'm not going to go into this too much, but for those who are interested, I'd be happy to chat more. We use a semi-supervised machine learning approach that results kind of uses three different algorithms. So first we do blocking, which is a way of reducing the size of the problem because uh, linking records together is very computationally intensive. So we can't actually compare every record with every other record like you might want to. So we need to do some things to reduce the number of comparisons we do. Then we do pairwise classification, which helps us determine whether two record, we think two records refer to the same person. And then once we have all of these different pairs of records that could refer to the same person, we need to cluster them so that instead of getting pairs that refer to the same person, we can get 
whole groups of records that are referring to the same individual. And after we do this, we know, we know both that we've deduplicated the data, so we're not you know, counting Hossam and Well multiple times, and we can also identify which sources document Hossam and Well. So we can say, oh, there are records for this person in source A and source B and source C, but not in source D. So once we do the record linkage, we can erase these question marks in this blue column that I've circled here, and we can actually fill that in with information. Now we're gonna move over to the green bit, right? So these again are missing values in documented records. We know who these victims are. We're just missing some information about what happened. So our goal is to fill in these missing fields. And this is important because if we wanna stratify these fields, we need, by these fields, we need to do something with missing data. So we have no missing data on the state and year fields. So if we just wanted to do, say, a map of violence by state or a line graph of violence over time, we'd be in good shape. We wouldn't actually have to impute anything because we know that information already. But if we want to do these more interesting stratifications and, and stratifications that are in line with a lot of our analysis goals, we need to do something about the missing data. So our imputation approach consists of two steps. So first we're gonna create what are called support variables, which are going to help us in the imputation. So this data frame here, this is obviously a condensed version of what we have, but there's still not really a lot of information here. Like there's a lot of information you could imagine wanting to know, but it doesn't fit into the standardized sort of schematic that we have. So what we do here is we use a lot more information. So most of the records have a free text field. We use this free text field to kind of support what we're going to do with the imputation to provide us more information about what's happening. And then we're going to apply multiple imputation, which is a particular statistical imputation technique that involves filling these missing data in multiple times. And the reason we wanna do this is because we have uncertainty as to what the real value is. The data is missing, we don't know what the answer is. We might be pretty sure it's something or something else, but we don't have certainty. So we're going to use a statistical model, a probabilistic model to fill this missing data in multiple times so that we can measure and represent our uncertainty rather than sweeping that uncertainty under the rug and sort of hiding it. So to do this, and what we did with the Truth Commission is we created 10 different versions of the data set each with the missing data filled in slightly differently. And importantly, and, and for those of you who might wanna use the data, what's important to know here is you can't pick one single file and analyze it. That's not a complete picture. You need to use multiple files and then pull your results because this is going to allow you to propagate the uncertainty through. Um, and just to give you a little picture of the uncertainty, or sorry, the missingness is highly heterogeneous. So we have a range of no missing information for the sex field for disappearance victims to 70% missing for uh, the presumed perpetrator of disappearance victims, right? So we have highly variable missingness. And of course, for the instances where we have a higher number of, or a higher proportion of missing data, of course, we're going to have more uncertainty in the imputation because we just have less information. So it's real. So you see based on the magnitude of these things, it's, you can't just ignore the missing data, right? It's not that it impacts 1% of the records. It really is something we, we actually have to address. Okay, so we do the imputation, we're all good. We're filling in these uh, green cells, but we're doing it multiple times, right? So we have 10 different versions of the data. And once we do this, once we have this all filled in, we're ready to do multiple systems estimation. And this is where we're kind of going to close the loop and do finish our final task, which is, considering the um, victims whose violence has never been documented. Um, so in some fields, this is also called capture recapture. So for example, in ecology, they often call it capture recapture. And basically what this does is we're going to use the documentation patterns for these victims we have documented to try and estimate the total victim population, which includes those victims who were never documented by any of the data sources. Um, and again, these documentation patterns come from record linkage, I mentioned this before, but just to give you kind of more concrete, let's assume person one was documented by sources A and B, but not source C. We could give them what's called an inclusion vector of one, one, zero, right? So one, they were in source A, one, they were in source B, zero, they were not in source C. Person two, similarly, documented in sources A and C, but not in B, right? One, zero, one. And person three was only documented by source B, zero, one, zero. Um, and this requires three or more sources um, because we have to make some assumptions and we need to have three or more sources to be able to make a reasonable set of assumptions. I put an asterisk there because I just said 
We need three sources. You can do it with two sources. I'm about to show you an example with two sources to give you an intuition, but we would never actually do this in practice because we have to make assumptions that are so strong that they don't actually ever apply in human rights contexts. In some ecological contexts, if you ever look at the ecology literature, you will see people doing uh, capture and capture with two sources, totally valid, totally reasonable, but our contexts are very, very different. So this is something we need to take into consideration. Um, I'm sorry, there's math notation on the board, but I think this is really helpful for just giving you a little bit of intuition about what, what's happening under the hood. This is a very simplistic model. This is not the model we use, but it does help you kind of understand what would happen in a more complex model. So I want you to imagine uh, an unknown size population of victims, and I'm going to call that N. So N is on the screen as this kind of gray cloud. And then we have some documented victims. So we have two sources, source A and source B. So A is this dark green source and B is this lighter green source. Each of them document some victims. And you'll notice the overlap M of the Venn diagram. Those are the victims that were documented on source A and source B. So if we were working with those inclusion vectors I talked about before, we would have for these victims at M, an inclusion vector of one, one. For the victims that are only in A, that would be one, zero, and only in B, that would be zero, one. Okay, great. So we, we've set up the problem. We're ready to go to math now. And this, for me, the first time I, I saw this was like the most magical statistics result ever. Um, so hopefully some of you will feel it's, it's kind of cool today. So if we want to, and, and we're going to make an assumption, and this is the strong assumption we need to avoid, and this is why we use three or more lists, we're going to assume list A and list B are independent. Now, statistically, what that means is the probability of being on list A has nothing to do with the probability of being on list B. These two things have, have nothing to do with each other. Of course, we can imagine reasons why this is not true, right? That social visibility bias I talked about before is, is kind of a very evident one. But let's assume for now, just to give you the intuition. So the probability of being on list A, well, that's just going to be the number of people on list A divided by the, the total population. We don't know the total population, we can still plug it in there. Does that make sense, right? If you're, if you're on A, it's A over N, right? You're on A over the total population size. B is very similar, right? So you're on list B, but we're going to divide by the total population size to get sort of an estimate of the probability of being on list B. Now, M you can write in the same right way, right? You can just say M over N, okay, I'm done. Or we can use our independence assumption. So this is almost like we're flipping two coins now. So we can say that the probability of being on list M, well, that's just the probability of being on list A and the probability of being on list B. So we wanna multiply the probability of being on A by the probability of being on B, right? So we get A times B over N squared. And now this equation, M over N equals A times B over N squared, well, we can solve for N here, right? We can get an estimate of N, our unknown population size, if we do a bit of rearranging of the terms. So what you get when you do some, some algebra, I've skipped here, but I'm happy to go through it if you have any questions, is we get our estimate for N and hat is just the number of people on list A times the number of people on list B divided by N, so the number of people that were on both uh, A and B. Intuitively, what does this mean? If you have a lot of people that are just on list A or just on list B, our estimate for N hat is going to be really, really big, right? We're gonna estimate more that there are more victims than we've documented. But if our lists have a lot of overlap, we're going to say, oh, well, we've probably documented a lot of the population. So N hat is going to be close to M. It's not going to be identical to M, but it's going to be closer to M relative to this other situation where we have a lot of people that are only on one of the lists. I don't know if you think that's magical, but this is a little bit of intuition about what's happening, right? So when we have a lot of victims that are only on one list, we think they have probably a very low probability of being documented. So there's probably many other people who have never been documented. Whereas when there's high overlap between the different sources, we think, oh, we've probably documented a lot of the victims, not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, so, okay, once we do this, again, we're using a more complicated model, but once we do multiple systems estimation, we've dealt with this yellow bit here. We've actually estimated the total number of victims, including those that have never been documented by any list. And the way we kind of interact with the multiple imputation is what we're going to do is we're going to repeat these estimates on each of our files, right? Each of our 10 files, and then pool those results together. And that way at the end, when you have your kind of final estimates, those estimates represent both the uncertainty of the imputation 
and the uncertainty of the estimation itself. And then you get graphs like these. Um, oh, these are large enough. Okay, great. Um, so uh, I'm gonna just briefly talk about probably just, let's see, which one do I wanna talk about? I'll talk about the recruitment of child soldiers. So here there are kind of three colors at play. So the black line on the bottom, that represents the number of documented victims. So these are victim, uh, victims of recruitment that are documented in the data source. The blue line is the mean of our estimates of the imputed number of victims. So for example, some of the victims of recruitment were missing age information. And since we wanna study the recruitment of child soldiers, some of those victims are going to be assigned as children, whereas others are adults who are recruited for other purposes. So after imputing, our mean estimate of the number of child soldiers is slightly higher than the number we documented to begin with because some information was missing. I think you have a laser there, no? Right there. Oh, wow. <laughs> right, so we see in this case, like the blue line is a bit above the black line. Yeah. And then when we come here, this is our uh, estimation range. So rather than the point estimate of the mean, this is sort of our uncertainty interval. So we think, for example, in what year is this? Uh, maybe 2002. We think that the total number of child soldiers was somewhere in this range. We haven't plotted the median. It's not that important. And what you learn here is that in general, the, the trend of the estimation follows the documented line in general. But there's all this white space in between. That white space, that's the under registration, right? That's the number of victims we estimate there could be that have never been documented by any data sources. Now you might be saying, oh, well, you know, Maria, it's just a magnitude issue, it's not a pattern issue. It is often a magnitude issue, but it can also be a pattern issue, right? When we estimate here, we, we see there, there might be a peak here and there's kind of a little bit of a peak in the documented data. But when you look at the estimates, you say, oh, actually, there's something missing here that the data has been biased in a particular way, that means we're not actually seeing this, right? So this just gives us more to think about. And for me, when I see an estimate like that in particular, that's not the end. The question is why? Hmm. Why was the data generated in this way such that we missed this peak? What was going on? What can we learn about the context? So we see here, oh, we should estimate it's not just a magnitude problem, but also it can be a pattern problem. And you know, as a statistician, I view when we see a pattern problem, not as the end of the discussion, but rather the beginning of a deeper investigation in, in terms of what was happening contextually that would have resulted in that. Um, okay, so that's kind of what we did in the sort of with the Truth Commission, right? So in, in the context of that project. Since then, um, DANE, which is the National Statistics Office in Colombia, has published anonymized versions of the data from our project that anyone can use, which I think is really amazing. Um, so these are freely available online uh, and published with a Creative Commons license, which is a huge win um, because that means other people can publish the data, other people can use the data, and that's really great for us. Um, they've published data about disappearances, homicides, kidnapping, and illegal recruitment. Um, for those of you who use data, the data is available in two different file types, normal CSV files and parquet files. And they've published 100 replicate files um, of each uh, violation that we can use to reflect the uncertainty in the statistical imputation. Replicate files 1 through 10 were used in the Truth Commission, um, but in sort of the process of publishing the data, we've made 90 more replicate files available for researchers so we can get more precise uncertainty estimates. But during the project itself, it was really hard to work even with 10 um, replicate files because there's just so much data. Um, uh, so this is just the link. Um, and I, I, I can work with Josefina to get this to you if you're interested. Um, but yeah, the data is just on Dani's website. Um, there's also a lot of metadata that they've published. So a lot of description about how the data was put together and it's a really good resource. So if it's something you're curious about, I would I would definitely recommend. And this is also on the, on the Transmedia. Yes. Yes, so you can access it from many different ways. And, and that's one of the amazing things about the Creative Commons license is that sure. it can be accessible from a lot of different places. Um, and now I just wanna talk a tiny bit about what's next and then I'm gonna summarize and I'm gonna stop speaking and drink water. Um, but we hope that people are going to use this data one to replicate the findings of the Truth Commission report um, and our team's methodological report. So. Um, this data was primarily used in the chapter of the Truth Commission report on um, violations of international human uh, on international humanitarian law. We hope that people will 
design their own analyses of the conflict. Um, that's really important to us, not just to replicate what has happened, but also to imagine other analyses that we couldn't get to when we were working with the commission and the HEP. And then we hope that people will incorporate their results of multiple systems estimation into other types of statistical modeling. So I presented today sort of like population size estimation as an end result, right? We see this pattern over time, but you can use those estimates in other models. You can use those estimates in say regression models or machine learning models to do other things. So we want the end to be something that is beyond just population size estimation. And I just wanna say briefly that these methods, not the exact same model we use and not the exact same procedures, just because they've changed so much over time, have been used in other contexts. So these methods, a version of multiple systems estimation has been used in, in both the Trade Commission reports in Guatemala and Peru. Um, it's been used to study uh, killings in the Bosnian conflict, uh, as well as uh, HRDAG has some ongoing work in Syria and some historical work in Syria, using this to study um, primarily civilian casualties. And for those of you who read Spanish, um, Colombian NGO de Justicia has this amazing, amazing report about how truth commissions have used statistics in the past that I think is just such an amazing read. And if you're interested in how, in, in how these methods have been used, that would be a really great resource. Um, and I've just put a shortened URL there, um, but it's very easy to find online. Um, and finally, uh, this is something I've been working a lot on recently, is uh, we've created this R package called Verdata, um, to kind of aid researchers in using these data that we know might be in an unfamiliar format. Um, so we want to facilitate the correct use of the data and the main functionality are kind of threefold. So first, uh, because of the Creative Commons license, we want to make sure that people can verify the fidelity of the data that they're using that hasn't been altered in some way that might result in sort of erroneous conclusions. Second, uh, we have functionality that can help researchers replicate what we do in our methodological report. And then, of course, we have functions that would help research kind of in uh, researchers in designing their own um, analyses of the conflict. Free and open source, uh, currently on GitHub, hopefully one day soon on CRAN, um, but I have some more work to do. And uh, I just want to end with a brief summary. Um, so what do we talk about today? Uh, we talked about the right to truth, and I hopefully convinced you how statistics can be one of the tools to examine the truth, even in these situations where we don't have a complete panorama of what's happened. We talked a bit about why data might be missing in the context of an armed conflict, specifically in Colombia, but a lot of these ideas are not unique to the Colombian conflict. Uh, and we also discussed the different types of missing data we encountered in this project. Uh, then I went through a statistical workflow and I say a statistical workflow is our statistical workflow, but it's not the only statistical workflow um, that we could estimate the total number of victims of enforced disappearance, homicide, kidnapping, and recruitment of child soldiers, taking into consideration this under documentation. And finally, I mentioned how you could access the data and a little bit about this R package that would facilitate the use of the data. Um, that's all I have. That's my email if you have any questions after today. Um, thanks so much for listening, and I look forward to both the discussions and any questions you have. <laughs> uh, lot, lot to think about in there, a lot of really, really interesting questions. <laughs> Um, rather than uh, me or someone else try to respond to all of that, we have two um, very accomplished people here that are going to do a little bit of that for us. Um, so, Jasmine, if you're ready. You sure. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Well, thanks, Maria, for this fantastic presentation. I'm very excited about the, the, the project. I think there is, a, you, you obviously did a lot already with the team, but there is so much more to be done with this data that it's, it's very exciting to, to be part of this conversation. Um, I usually like to just say something about what, um, well, you know, restate a little bit the big questions that this project addresses, and these questions are huge and are questions that we are asking in a range of other settings, in a range of other conflicts, or even other instances of violence, really, which is, what do we do? Um, how can we document instances of violence that were never reported? How do we deal with incomplete records? And how do we deal with discrepancies in data sources and narratives about violence, really? Um, and this is, as you mentioned in your presentation, something that is hugely important for establishing a record, a, a record of truth in post-conflict societies for mm -hmm. not only for society to come to terms with its past, but also for the possibility of redress for the victims. Right now, we're talking more at the aggregate level, but hopefully this will also allow us to dive deeper into more individualized dynamics of victimization and how we can apply those global patterns to also unveiling more individualized violations. Um, and I think 
I don't know if this is something you're exploring yet, but I'm also thinking that that could open really interesting doors for the search of new victims. Um, and this is where I think statistics really contribute to this truth seeking exercise because it's an iterative exercise. The, the door is not closing right now with the collection of data, contrary to testimonies that you know are in this big book of the Truth Commission report, we can always add more data, more data sources to statistics, which allows to constantly expand the scope uh, of what we know. Um, and I also, also think the project switches the discourse about truth in a very interesting way because we're talking about the universe of possibles. We're not talking about what unique truth that we know, but we're talking about a range of possibles that um, allows to open this conversation about the role of uncertainty and potentially also be an important bridge between different narratives about the conflict. Uh, and I, I will go back on this later. Um, I think something that from the perspective of peace studies is also really interesting is that can also talk about the structure of silences in the data. We obviously have the data that, that is registered, but we also have the, the structure of the data that we don't have, that we don't know about, which opens really interesting cross-pollination poss possibilities with other disciplines. Um, because it relates to wartime political orders, it relates to social dimensions such as gender, such as ethnicity, that uh, using other types of ethnographic methods or even the testimonies we can better document to inform the data and make it into a more deep, a deeper and a richer uh, source of data. And I, I was talking to you just before about my own case, the case of Guatemala, which is hugely skewed in terms of how victims are registered. And this is one of the first cases that, that HR DAG has, has worked on. And the skewness is itself endogenous to the dynamics of conflict, obviously. Mm -hmm. And what is really interesting in my case is that the uh, politicization of people during war and popular resistance actually makes the victims in certain areas much more documented than others because as people politicized during conflict they also reported more and became more aware of their rights and therefore also more aware of what it meant to report violations and to do this truth exercise so uh the the distribution of data is in itself data about war and political orders and the structure of violence during during conflict um and I think, so what I was saying about the possibilities of cross-pollination with other uh, disciplines, what Josefina was saying in the introduction is, what is the role of statistics and how does it interact with other disciplines? And you said it yourself, there needs to be some type of dialogue uh, between those between different disciplines and between different modes of scientific inquiry in conflict. Uh, and as you were showing the, the, the graph on child soldiers, I thought this is, very interesting because we know by looking at the statistical distribution of the the actual register of victims and uh, the estimation that there is some type of bias there, but we don't know why. And this is exactly where some more ethnographic forms of research methods, this is where narratives of conflict, this is where historical research can actually inform the type of patterns of violence. Um, that uh, both at the temporal and the geographic level actually explain why we are dealing with those things. So I think this is where we still probably need a lot of conversations about best to create research methodologies that are going to integrate these different types of approaches and to make statistics um, only one tool within this big toolbox of uh, causal inference or even social science inference uh, to study conflict. Um, and finally, something that I I also think is really interesting in this uh, approach in that centers uncertainty and the range of possibles in the discourse is that it allows to accommodate different regimes of truth. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really important when we're dealing with such polarized post-conflict societies as Colombia, but as many others as well. Mm -hmm. We constantly have different narratives that are um, pitted against one another. We also have, to a certain extent, some type of misinformation about conflict. Um, and so talking about a universe of possibles, a range of violations, a range of attribution actually allows to first potentially dismiss some very skewed narratives about that are driven by misinformation, but also bridge the gap between mm -hmm. narratives of conflict that are seen as diametrically opposed, but are, are in fact lie in different uh, areas of the spectrum of possible. So we can say, well, you're underestimating or you're under attributing certain types of violations to certain perpetrators, 
but we know that there is this range of possibles that we can be uh, situated within. So it's also really useful to build a common narrative about what happened and not say, this is the truth, this is what we are handing to society, and there is nothing else that can um, contravene what we're saying, because that always opens, obviously, the, the possibility for refutation and for, uh, for people to be particularly triggered by you know, discourses of absolute truth in, in post-conflict periods. Mm -hmm. So this is these are my comments on a more broad level and about very exciting opportunities for us to, to engage with this work as someone who's not as versed in statistics, like where do, does this fit? Where does political science research fit? Anthropological research fit in this bigger research agenda? Um, so thank you so much again for, for the presentation. I'm looking forward to the workshop tomorrow as well. And I'm sure Matthew will have much more specific <laughs> comments about the statistical methods, but this is this is amazing work. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you. you know me too well. All of my comments are about this. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, it actually works. I'm glad I went second. I have some very narrow um, questions about this. But first, I just want to echo um, everyone else's comments about how fascinating this work is and how exciting it is. I have to hear more about it. Apparently, my voice is also going to go a little bit, but uh, let's see what we can do with that. Um, <clears throat> I had some two two kind of, I think of it as like application questions or application thoughts, given that if, if I'm thinking of myself as a researcher who might be interested in applying this in the future, maybe you could provide some additional guidance on uh, particularly thinking about um, the amount of resources it would appear to take to perform one of these analyses, right? So. Um, but, but the first question I wanted to know, and, and I think um, I'll make the general caveat now that I think um, a lot of my questions are not so much questions or criticisms, but I think of them more as like jumping off points for a deeper discussion of the statistics, right? I understand the need to kind of pitch this at a certain level and then, and, and I'm gonna drag us into the, the nitty gritty, I suppose. <laughs> um, so um, the, first, the first thing I wanted to know was uh, about the ability of the, the model or the pipeline to create descriptive inferences over what types of enumerators miss what types of violence over which is, I'm assuming there's some strata that you're fitting these over based on those covariates that you were showing us, right? So, and if, if we know that, is it possible to say, you know, based both on Columbia, based on the other cases that you were mentioning where you've applied similar methods, is it possible to make some collapse some enumerators into broad categories, collapse some strata into broad categories and make probabilistic statements about what types of enumerators are most likely to miss what types of violence or what type in what types of, of strata. And could we potentially back out, um, you know, for example, um, government backed enumerated go government backed um, truth commissions are, are potentially less likely to receive uh, reports of violence by government aligned paramilitaries, right? So if we that based on exactly no data strikes me as somewhat possible. Mm -hmm. um, and if we know that, could we take that forward and say, okay, we expect that pattern in the future and we understand kind of faced with this universe of possible enumerators, who suffers from which, and, and not, not, not even to call it, uh, to borrow your phrase, it's statistical bias, not necessarily um, any other type of bias and that they're not trying to collect that, it, it's simply unwillingness on the part of victims to, to come forward in certain patterns. Um, and, it, and if we know that, kind of, um, uh, if we were able to build those kind of statements, could we use that to one, inform data collection um, by the enumerators so they understand their own biases, right? And so move this come from kind of retrospective to perspective for the enumerators and say, we suspect your weaknesses are, are here in these locations, right? INGOs, we suspect you have strong urban bias, right? We suspect that you're you're relying really heavily on um, a news report or something like that. Um, and then if if moving that to the question about um, the ability to kind of resource these analyses, right? So it seems like to me that the inclusion of each additional enumerator is not at all a trivial process, right? So you have all of the data cleaning steps, which I having received some of data like this, I suspect is, is a, a lift. And then you're creating these, uh, this large, I think it's 12 million observations, right? So you have to do uh, uh, machine learning in order to identify the overlap, right? And, and then um, you, what I'm imagining you're left with is, is kind of a sparse list of who's on what list, a sparse set of who's on what list. 
and, and sparse matrices like that have their own problems, right? Um, is there a way for us to, to, to make some kind of determination about the relative contribution of information from one of these enumerators, right? Could we say, um, you know, in, in now that we now that you fit the model in Columbia, given what we have, this is the relative contribution over uh, uncertainty or variance or, or over kind of coverage of the, the estimate. Um, you know, this information was most this 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 enumerator contributed the most information, and then could we take that? moving forward and say, okay, if I have constraints on my ability to, to collect all of these enumerators, who do I, if, if, let's say that there's some, I have some few enumerators that are, are fairly easy to get, government source, NGO source. Um, could you make a determination about where to allocate effort into collecting the next enumerator? So if you can't get all of the um, enumerators, could you determine who, again, based on this kind of potential overlap so unknown overlap, right? It's, it's um, based on who misses what in what strata. Could you say, um, could you determine what would be probable in, in terms of uh, who to target next in this kind of stepwise fashion? Because um, that would be really fascinating, assuming that it's not at all easy to collect the universe of, of cases as you have here. Um, I think I had a couple. Yeah. I got a couple more um, uh, maybe deeper dive questions on on uh, the specifics of the statistics, which I can just touch on really briefly, and then you can say um, come to the workshop, and we'll go over them. <laughs> yeah. I, I'll give a plug in for that. Um, so the first question I have is about uh, what I think is your multiple imputation. So um, do you have a sense? So from your table, so we have different types of missingness. So this gets a little bit. Um, tricky lexically because you have multiple types of missing this. So I'm talking about missing this on what I would call your covariates, the missing this on your observations. Um, do you have a sense, since we can't really test the assumptions behind what form of missing this we have over those covariates, do you get the sense? So just from your table, right, we're not missing fully at random, right? Because I can see it. Um, not that that was ever really a possibility. Um, and, and so can we, and there's, there's no test for missing at random versus missing not at random or not ignorable. But given that you've spent a ton of time with the data, do you have a sense of how realistic the, oh, so, so one, I'm assuming that the, the missing at random assumption is necessary. Um, and if it is, do you have a sense of how realistic that is? And then if it's, you know, how, um, if it's going wrong, how bad could it go wrong? So I assume what we're doing is taking these these strata into the um, the capture recapture, right, and, and maybe trying to build strata where that independence assumption that you were showing us that, that we probably don't buy for the, the full set, but maybe we can find strata where the independence assumption holds. Um, but does that depend on us, you know, having unbiased collection of those strata and and knowing all of the strata? Is it possible that right, given the kind of the initial, um, so so given the um, ways in which the enumerators are collecting information, is it possible that they're simply completely missing strata that we might want information for? Um, uh, I think I hit on the, um, the independence assumption, which is the next comment. And then the, the other thing I was wondering, um, is this, is so can we model this in a way that, and, and maybe you are already, and it's just my lack of familiarity. In, in so in my field, we would call this a like common factor model. So we would model this um, as common shocks that different enumerators react differently to. So we could take your urban bias and say, but other of all of our enumerators, the enumerators have different uh, propensity to be affected by urban bias. Right, and then we could represent that as a factor loading, right, on urban bias, even if we don't necessarily know the the, the factor itself. So it would be possible to use uh, a kind of model where we could treat this as enumerators responding differently to different types of biases, and then learn about the enumerators in that way. Um, or is that something that's uh, not feasible from the information that we have? And I think that's all my comments. I look forward to chatting more. Thank you.
Okay, before we open the floor to uh, broader questions, um, do you, is there a couple of Matt's questions that you yeah, just want I would, to I would touch on real quick? Yeah. Um, those are all really great questions. Thank you. Um, so first, I will say in the case of Colombia, it's hard from like the perspective of a member of the public to do this analysis of the different sources, just because as part of the anonymization procedure, we had to anonymize the sources. So rather than listing, you know, this source, and I do have in my slides a list of, and in our technical appendix, we do tell you all the sources we've used, but as part of the publication with Dane, we needed to anonymize the sources to prevent re-identification, basically. Um, so in theory, it would be possible to do that, but in practice in the Colombian project, it's not possible at the point of being a member of the public accessing the data. Um, but I think this would be really interesting. I think one of the complexities of the Colombian project that we haven't ever seen in a project before is we receive data from so many different sources. So for context, our other big projects have involved like five or six organizations. So for the Colombian project, we have 44. So you can do a lot of the things you were talking about with five or six sources in a very manageable way. When you have 44 sources, you just have this like a scale explosion. Um, so for example, like trying to think about, oh, what sources are biased in what ways, you can totally do that with five or six sources. Maybe you can do that with 44 sources, but you have to do dimension reduction at some point, and that requires a lot of subjectivity. That's not a bad thing, but at some point you need to make some decisions about how to collapse sources, how to categorize sources, and it's not always we don't always have as much information about these enumerators as we'd like to. So it can be kind of hard to make those um, distinctions, but you could absolutely do that. Um, yeah, I think one of the things that so you mentioned sort of shifting from retrospective to perspective, and that's really interesting, but I think in terms of practically how we end up interacting with the data is we tend to be analyzing the data after something has happened. There's really a limit on like, the time scale we can do our work on. So we can't really do like you now casting, right? We can't actually look at the violence that's happening today and analyze it today. And the reason is because documentation, documentation takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort and it, it often is not complete until many, many years after. I mean, you know, this is the whole game of the Truth Commission, right? Is they're collecting testimonies about violence that has happened many years in the past. So while some organizations might have some sort of real-time information, Realistically, to get the whole picture, there is often a lag. So while maybe this information would be useful in kind of informing current data collection, you're always going to have sort of like a context bias. Like, of course, our recommendations are most useful for the context that they described. And the context 10 years ago may be very different from the context today. So I think there, there is possibility to learn things, but I think going from truly retrospective to prospective would, isn't best suited to our methods, right? There might be other methods to do that. Um, yeah, so our, uh, and you talked about adding additional sources, right, and that being kind of a, a hard thing. So I want to say yes and no to that. So yes, it required a lot of effort, but because we use a very particular workflow, and I didn't really touch on this, our work is easily scalable, it's reproducible, it's transparent, and it's auditable. And this is because we work in these really contentious settings where we need all these things to be true. So yes, while we do need to clean more data and we do need to rerun a lot of code, Actually, to include a new source is quite easy. So the only thing I manually need to do is the data pre-processing, which I say, oh, the only thing I need to do, right, <laughs> which can be a big thing, but like, I only need to do that. And then actually our pipeline is such that I can just rerun the record linkage. So right, I can go clean my data, rerun my full record linkage pipeline. I don't have to do anything else. Actually, I can just set it to run and go do other things, rerun my estimates, which takes an, an out of this world amount of time. But actually the pipeline is there. So yes, there's a cost, but the cost is actually mostly time and not necessarily like human mm -hmm. effort hours, right? Like I can go and do other things while my estimates are running. And I spent many times babysitting an AWS instance <laughs> while estimates ran. Um, and then I wanna just touch on um, kind of a couple of other things you mentioned. So you talked about the missing assumptions. So what we are assuming is that the data is missing at random when we, condition on all of the covariates and those support variables I mentioned. So I didn't talk about them too much, but when we take into consideration this like heterogeneous high dimensional information. So we think that when we condition on all of this information, the data is probably missing at random, but we need to do this full conditioning and adding the support variables 
was really important to the amputation that really helped stabilize and improve the amputation. Without that, we just like simply didn't have enough information and we just had like kind of ridiculous levels of uncertainty at the point where the amputation was basically saying everything and nothing all at once. Um, so yes, yeah, so fully conditional specification, we think we can say it's missing at random. Um, the independence assumption, uh, this is really great, totally glazed over this. Um, there are two ways to deal, or we deal with this independence assumption issue. The first way is stratification. So we try and create strata where we think that the probability of being any one person being documented is, is similar, right? But that's often not enough. So we use a particular type of multiple systems estimation model that also makes use of latent classes. So we kind of do some control by a stratification to group similar records together, but then we let the latent classes help us out in determining that. And sometimes you fit the model and realize it's not well stratified, right? So you get a posterior distribution that has multiple modes. So then you go back and stratify more fine. But we're basically using a mix of stratification and latent classes to help us model the, uh, the dependence between lists and get around the um, heterogeneity of captures, what they call it in the literature issue. Um, and then finally, you mentioned this sort of like uh, the propensity to have particular types of biases and how, how could we factor that in. I think this is really interesting. I haven't really thought about how we might actually factor it in before. But again, I think with 44 lists, it becomes really complicated. I think in some of the other projects where we have five or six lists, it's a lot more manageable. But I guess my question would be, say we know a list is biased, say we can calculate some factor. It's not intuitive to me how that factor then gets factored into the estimation model, for example. Um, but I think that is really interesting. But I think, yeah, for the Columbia project, it's probably not feasible with size. But I think for some of the other projects that we've done, um, it could be possible. Yeah, thanks. Great. Um, really nice to have uh, a little bit of uh, the back and forth and uh, another plug for the workshop tomorrow. We'll go to much more detail into the statistics. Um, at this point, I do want to go ahead and just open up the floor for, for general questions. We've got probably about 15 minutes uh, or so. Um, Uh, I know it's always hard to be the first penguin <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so regarding the child recruitment, um, I'm not sure I fully understand. Uh, I'm not a I'm a lawyer and I, so I, I, I don't understand specific. But how do you make assumptions? I don't I I would imagine that males are more susceptible to uh, recruitment than females. And maybe the geographic location of these minors has an impact on their susceptibility to recruitment. So if the goal is to make an extrapolation or an imputation, I think you call it, about the scope of child recruitment, do you try, can you measure or take into consideration those yeah, issues? Absolutely. So that's, that's what we do as part of a process called stratification. So this is what I was just mentioning. So I showed you a, a graph over time, which is totally the correct graph, but it's slightly disingenuous because I didn't just estimate the number of um, child recruitment victims in year 2000 and year 2001. Actually, what that is, is an aggregation of other strata. So we did at minimum all of our estimates at the department, so at the state year level. And then we go and we fit a model and we say, is the model fitting well? And if the model fits well, we're okay. But in some instances, for example, we actually need to stratify the data more finely. We need to disaggregate the data more to take into consideration things like differential reporting by sex, for example. And it's not about differential incidence for our models. That, that doesn't actually matter. We know that more men, we have documented more men and we would estimate more men have been affected. The problem for our model would be if we're more likely to document girls than boys, that's where we start to run in modeling problems. But we have tools that can help us do this. And one of the tools we have is we can more finely do the estimates. So rather than doing it at the state and year level, we might do it at the state, year, and sex level, if that makes sense. Um, and of course, this information about the sex of the victim, the location, the year, this also helps us with the imputation because there might be certain situations or certain contexts we were where we where we were more likely to have certain types of victims. So if that information is missing, we can use this to inform the imputation as well. I hope that makes sense. That, that does. Now, where do you get the information about total population minors and you know 
children under age. Yeah, so a lot of our sources document this information directly. So we might receive a database, say, from the state or from a civil society organization, and they're going to include a wealth of information, including a lot of information we're not able to include. So, for example, all of our sources at minimum include the name of the victim, the year the violation took place, and the state where it took place. Many of them also include the victim's exact age in years. So with that information, we're able to say, okay, we have documented these people under the age of 18, these people over the age of 18. In the Colombian case, it was also very important to distinguish under 15, 15 to 18, and then, I mean, 18 and above wasn't relevant for the child soldiers case, but we were able to use this exact age information. Now, unfortunately, some sources only include information such as a minor versus adult. So in this case, when we do the imputation, we do it knowing that we think the person is a minor, so we're going to impute them as being a minor. We don't know their exact age, but we're going to use, again, a statistical model to fill in that exact age. But a lot of the sources do actually have this information. So this is something we were able to impute so that we could do the filtering to kind of distinguish between these different situations that were important for the commission's work. Um, Sorry, I before you do your like iterative imputation, do you also do some sort of validation where you're like doing an error, calculating some sort of error rate on based on your <clears throat> data um, to estimate sort of how often you're accurately imputing things and include that in the uncertainty or draw the uncertainty basically after it wins? This is always a big problem. How do you validate imputation? Uh, and the thing is, on real data, you really can't validate it because the data is not there. Um, and you can like, people do all these simulations, right? Where they like erase some of the data and are like, oh, look how good my imputation works. But the problem is I have no idea if those simulated conditions actually reflect the real world. So there, there's, there's no real way. And this is such an unsatisfying answer. I always hate giving this answer. There's no actual way to validate what's happening. Right. I mean, I think if we had a situation where imputation like imputed every single record to be one of the perpetrator categories and not the others, we would we would say, okay, this is probably like not correct. But beyond that, it's really difficult to know. I will say, like, one check we did is we just looked at the relative proportions in the observed data. So say for a perpetrator, presumed perpetrator, we look at what the, the breakdown is in the observed data and then the imputed data. And what we see is Yes, there are differences, but generally they're pretty similar. And that's kind of what we expect. I mean, we expect there to be some differences, but it would be really stark if like all of the missing data belong to the paramilitaries, for example. But if that were the case, that's also probably something we would kind of know qualitatively. Like that, that is a missing data generating mechanism we could probably learn about qualitatively. So while there's no way to actually check, what I can say to you is that there's some consistency between what's been documented and what's been imputed. There are some things that turn around a bit, but not like nothing changes uh, a lot. So I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for you, but if we knew this information, actually we wouldn't need to do the imputation because we would simply know the answer. Um, and that would be a lot better than, than needing to fill this stuff in probabilistically. Oh, um, oh, fascinating, thank you, <laughs> amazing. Um, <laughs> broader question that's more of a philosophical question about the nature of truth. So how does statistical truth figure in the bigger picture? What has been the response that you have received and how do you see that going forward? Um, because a lot of times as a, yeah, as a social scientist, I, I, I understand the importance of probability. I understand the importance of uncertainty, everything that you mentioned. But I also know for lay people, they want, you know, real true facts, right? Like in the legal sense. So how do you see your um, effort in, in, in that real world situation of you know, defining truth one way versus another? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll say that I think in general, this is a really hard thing to balance um, and certainly like different methodologies, different uh, epistemologies, like have different requirements for like, what is the truth? So like in a legal setting, like what's considered the truth might be very different than like how it's considered in a social science setting, for example. So the, the game is how do we balance this multiplicity of needs and this multiplicity of, of sort of validation of like what we consider a valid method. So I will say what I think is a big win 
is that we did these statistical estimates and they appear in one of the chapters of the Truth Commission. And one of the commissioners believed enough to like put these graphs of estimated victims in the report, even if they do focus a little bit more on what was imputed rather than what was estimated for these legal questions. Mm -hmm. I think that's a huge win. Like, irrespective of anything else, like that's a really big win that like someone was like, yes, this is worth including in the report. I think socializing the idea that not all violence is documented is really hard, but I think that's also something that we can have a win about is we can have these conversations about there are all sorts of reasons why violence isn't documented. And even having that conversation, irrespective of if it goes with a graph, irrespective of if it goes with an analysis, that's also really important because then we're socializing the idea that like, no, not all violence is documented. And if we want to tell the whole truth, right, this is this is where I started, right, telling the whole complete truth. Well, we have to say something about this, right? How, how do we talk about this? So as much as it's really complicated and even like as a statistician, like someone who's trained in doing this, like communicating uncertainty is really hard, just like generally. Mm -hmm. uh, and like specifically when you have like a really important, highly politicized and just like highly sensitive context, it's just like even harder. So I wanna say like, it's really, really hard, but I think we've kind of had some wins along the way. And I think publishing the data, um, a couple of my colleagues have been doing a ton of outreach work to kind of teach people how to use the data, how to use the software. I also think like we're train we're trying to train a new generation of social science researchers, of data scientists to be able to talk about these issues, to be able to analyze data that takes these things into consideration. So we're hoping that in the future we can have more of these conversations. Um, and I do want to say one thing is that sometimes people point to statistics and say that it's say at odds with testimony, right? So we might come to a conclusion statistically that is inconsistent with someone's individual experience of violence, say. And, and I wanna say that like, when we make these broad conclusions about statistics, they're not incompatible with the sort of contradictory narratives. Mm -hmm. Someone can have an experience that does not fit the general pattern of violence and that is totally valid and that neither negates that person's lived experience nor does it negate the statistical sort of generalization we're making, right? And, and I think just like holding all the complexity in your head is really hard, but as, as Joseph was saying before, the multiplicity of truth, right? Like both of these things can be true at the same time and neither one negates the other and just like holding the nuance in your head and like feeling comfortable being uncomfortable a little bit in that is just like a really important exercise in telling the truth and like telling the truth in all of its complexity, right? Which is one of the goals of the Truth Commission is to like not hide the complexity, but rather bring it to the forefront and just be transparent about that. Uh, I'm not sure I actually have like a good answer for you, but that's kind of been my experience related to this kind of question. I, I think there's a follow-up question, I guess, to that. There's so many um, conflicts and now, I guess, especially going forward, it's just you can't, you can't. real time, um, but you know, there will be a point in the future where, where we're going to have to look back at what happened. Um, and there's so much misinformation and disinformation, intentional um, and purposeful disinformation out there that you know, has been made more possible by current technologies. So, um, and of course, and that's even the case of backwards uh, for various different reasons, not just for technological, but there's always been campaigns. Yeah. So how do you have to really, uh, grapple with that now? And, and kind of, um, maybe be a bit of a profit. How, <laughs> how will that be dealt with, you know, going forward um, in a statistical kind of way? I, I understand to build the some uncertainty. Yeah. Well. Knowing that there's out there, this sort of could be out there this data that's um, that's purposefully incorrect rather than just miscollected or in incomplete. Yeah, I think this is a really hard question um, because sometimes it can be really hard to like validate or like invalidate information you receive. Um, I think one of the things that we kind of look for when we're trying to decide like whether or not we trust a source and. We certainly have had questions about this, not necessarily in the Colombian context, but in other contexts. You have to look like how that source relates to other sources, right? So if that source is like totally perpendicular, the information you receive is like totally perpendicular to everything else you receive. There either has to be a really, really good like sociological reason for why that would be the case, 
or like there's they're measuring a totally different thing right like otherwise you need to look at that and say like why is it that the source is just so egregiously different than the other things I document and, and there's no like I have no like neat methodology for that right like there's no like uh secret sauce for like how one does that but you you kind of just need to take it in context and say like okay how does this relate to like things I know to be true which again biased incomplete all of those things and and if there's basically no correspondence then I think you need to start asking like okay why would there be no correspondence is there any reason for that if the answer is no then then maybe that's actually not data we can trust so in our case, we don't actually directly collect basically any of the data we use. Um, so it's our partner organizations, so all those organizations I mentioned in the beginning, and all of them have like slightly different validation procedures. Most of them have like some sort of validation, but again, it varies a lot. And unfortunately, you can't always learn about the validation procedure because you're not in contact. There's no method, like a lot of them don't even have methodologies, like it's a really informal process. Uh, so yeah, this is really hard and it's probably going to get harder. I think like my job as a scientist and like anyone who's a scientist, like our job is to like make people trust us, right? To to like like create this like confidence with the public, with the truth commission, that like we are going to do the best we can with the data that's available and like building that trust, building that rapport. Because at the end of the day, the thing that like lends like me credibility in these settings is I can say I'm a scientist, I use scientific methods, I do so rigorously and robustly to bring you the best answer possible, right? It, it's not to say the data is perfect. It's not to say my methods are perfect, but there are so many things about working in conflict that results in like sub, sub ideal statistical analysis, right? Like basically everything about the data, for example, is not ideal in any way, but establishing that rapport and saying like, I'm a scientist, I'm trained to do this. I'm doing the best thing I can with what I have, I think is really important for lending credibility to the results right, to being able to say, I'm an expert in this and being transparent, right? Like things that we do in our workflow to ensure that this credibility can be trusted, right? Making sure our work can be audited and it's transparent and all of these things, I think helps us. But I think there's no secret kind of answer to how, how we can make the truth matter, right? If we're in a situation where the truth doesn't matter, then, you know, it's very hard for me, no matter what I say, it doesn't matter because actually the truth doesn't matter, right? So I think that's a much bigger question of how do we get ourselves out of out of a situation where actually the truth doesn't matter and, and something else actually is driving people's beliefs and understandings. Sorry, that's not a satisfying answer, but that's, <laughs> that's what I want. Yeah, it's, there is a lot of satisfying situation. Yeah. <laughs> at, the, at that point, we, we are at the point where we, we really should go and not disappoint the refreshments that are sitting at the <laughs> Do you, do you want to say um, just that thank you everyone so much our moderators discussants and of course our uh speaker thank you all uh for being here until so dark it's not very late but it's very dark um tomorrow we will have a workshop starting at nine in the morning in the jenkins nano week one oh zero no 10 30 uh if you guys want to play around a little bit with this data sets you don't need to be an expert in statistics to join. Uh, you're all very welcome. And as you know, we have the legacy project. So this is one of many what we have called legacy conversations uh, that will continue. I don't want to say perpetuity, but <laughs> for a very, very long time. And last but not least, thank you so much uh, to our staff for preparing uh, both the real room and uh, the virtual room. So thank you everyone and have a good night and I'll see you outside. <laughs>